Thank you for being here. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 12. We're uh, going to be down in verse 41. And probably I sound worse than I look, hopefully. Shouldn't have been yelling at my wife today. I apologize. I apologize. But I want to do a uh, chart tonight, if I can. And uh, we're going to use this board. And hopefully it's working. Is it? So we're looking at uh, Matthew 12, 41. So let's bow together in prayer. Uh, Lord, this is your word, not ours. You were speaking, we weren't. And we feel like we're being spoken to, and we want to understand what you're saying. And you are the only one that can communicate that to us. So we're asking tonight for a move of the Holy Spirit among us, and for a revelation of your face that would make us forever different. And Lord, we don't have a chance at that unless you come and do what we can't do. So give us your thoughts and give us your mind and give us your intent and uh, captivate us uh, with yourself, we pray thee. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, We're looking at verse 38. As you move into verse 38, of course, the uh, scribes and the Pharisees are looking for a sign. And Jesus, of course, won't play that game uh, because the kind of sign that they want, He isn't going to give them. So the the issue isn't really about signs at all. The issue is really about what kind of sign that they want, what would satisfy them. And so Jesus isn't against signs uh, because He has promised them He would give them a sign. And He begins to describe that sign in verse 39. And he calls them an evil and adulterous generation that are seeking after a sign. And no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then he describes what he means by that. And we walked through that last Saturday night. He said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now tonight we want to deal with, uh, try to deal with verse 41. He goes on to say, The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. I walked you through the story of Jonah. We went back to Jonah, only four chapters. You can read the whole thing in just a brief moment. And as you walk through his story, the word of the Lord has come to Jonah. And, of course, he didn't go after it. God came after him and gave him this tremendous assignment. And he was very irritated about the whole thing, didn't want to go. And so in disobedience to God, he bought a ticket and went to Tarsus on a ship. And, of course, ended up in the bottom of the ship sound asleep. And then the storm came, sent by God to awaken him, which God always allows storms to come to awaken us. So the storm has come to awaken him, and the captain comes down on the bottom of the ship and gets, calls him the sleeper and gets him out of bed, takes him up to the deck. They cast lots, and the lot falls on, falls on Jonah. So he becomes deeply aware of the fact that he is responsible, and he confesses that to all the sailors. So the only solution to the whole thing is to throw him overboard, which they don't want to do, so they try to get him to shore. And of course, um, they can't, and so they do end up throwing him overboard, and God had prepared a great fish that swallowed him. And he spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. Now, when you move into chapter 2 of Jonah, there's this interesting essence I never discovered this before. But as you read it, uh, you begin to find out that if you just take the text as for what it says, Jonah really died. 
Now, I've never heard that before. I've not had anybody ever tell me that. Uh, but for, and of course, it doesn't really matter whether he did or whether he didn't because it's a symbol. The belly of the fish is the symbol of the heart of the earth, which is parallel to Jesus. But when you go to chapter 2, where he is confessing, he says in verse 2, I cried out to you, the Lord, because of my affliction. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol I cried. Now Sheol, of course, is death. It's the abode of the dead. It's the Old Testament concept. So whether you believe that or not, it doesn't matter. But you find out that Jonah is symbolic of the entire death of Jesus. And it's a type that is going on. And as you get into verse 41 then, he begins to set up a contrast in light of that. And over on the one side, he talks about people. And there's a great contrast of the people in this verse. And we're going to look at that tonight. There is also a contrast in verse 41 of the preachers. Obviously, Jonah on the one hand and Jesus on the other. But what we'd like to deal with tonight is the people. Now, over here are the Ninevites. And over here are the Israelites. And those are the two people groups that we're dealing with uh, in the passage. Look at it with me, verse 41. The men of Nineveh, which are the Ninevites. So you've got the men of Nineveh on this side. And then he says, they shall rise up in the judgment with this generation. Now, who is this generation? Obviously, it re relates back to verse 39. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Well, who's seeking after a sign? Well, it's the scribes and the Pharisees in verse 38. So when you trace it through, there isn't any question that he's talking about the leadership of Israel on this side. And he sets up a contrast between the people, the men of Nineveh, and the scribes and the Pharisees of the Israelites. And I want to walk you through that contrast. Uh, start with this idea. The men. Uh, when you look over here to the Ninevites, who are these people of Nineveh? Uh, they were a nation that was a pagan nation. Obviously, they were Gentiles, and you recognize that the Gentiles were anybody that isn't a Jew. Uh, the Ninevites were the wicked, most wicked people of the pagans. Uh, even the pagans that were all around them said they were brutal and absolutely wicked at the core. So this was a group that was so evil and so wicked that their wickedness was literally crying out to God. And God took notice that something had to be done with this group. They had gone so far that God said, I've got to do something about them. So God moved in. And that's why he was talking to Jonah. These people had never ever heard about Jehovah, or if they had heard of Jehovah, through the fact that the, the God of Israel was defeating all of their enemies, if they had heard of God Jehovah, they had never heard about Him, meaning they had did no details about Him. In other words, they had no information about Him. He was just the God of Israel. They had never had contact with Him. There was no involvement between them and this God. See, this God had never visited them. This God had never been preached to them. They had never meant this God. They had never made sacrifices to this God, Jehovah. God, Jehovah, was far removed from this people. So when Jonah showed up for the very first time and began to preach to this group, this was the first news that they had ever had about God, Jehovah. This was brand new to them. Interesting. Again, their wickedness was so loud that it literally cried out to God and God had to do something about it. That's this group. Let's come over here to the Israelites now and parallel that to the Israelites. What have you got in the scribes and the Pharisees? They are the most righteous 
of their day. In fact, if you would look through all the earth, you would not find anybody who is more righteous than them. For 400 years or plus, they had unwaveringly done the law of God as they interpreted it. See, they had come out of Babylonian captivity. They, it was the last captivity of Judah. And when they came out of that thing, they finally dawned on them. It finally dawned on them that their problem in all of this was that they had disobeyed the law of God. And that's the reason they got into a mess. They vowed, we will never ever do that again. And so they clung to the law. In fact, out of that, you know, there developed this group of people called the Pharisees who literally said, we're going to keep Israel focused on what God states in His law. They developed 613 oral traditions to apply it. And they unwaveringly just stuck to this. For 400 years they've been doing the sacrifices. For 400 years they've been keeping the temple going. For 400 years they've been observing the feast days. For 400 years they've been keeping the Sabbath day holy. They are never going to budge from this. They have given themselves to the righteousness and the obedience to what they consider Jehovah wants them to do. It's an interesting contrast. The most righteous of the hour, the most unrighteous of the hour, the ones who know all about Jehovah, the ones who don't know anything about Jehovah, the ones that have the scrolls of the Word of God in their hands, the ones who've never read the scrolls and the Word of God. Righteousness, unrighteousness. And I know you're probably saying, well, so what? Here's the so what. I want you to take your life tonight, and you fit in this category, or you fit in this category. If you say tonight, hey, I'm off the streets, man. Oh, wasn't raised in church, didn't have a Christian home. Don't know anything about Jesus but a cuss word. Done everything I want to do and some things I didn't want to do. Evil at the core. Could I tell you that your life is screaming out to God? And that He is so absolutely concerned about you that He has sent His messenger to you. Because he can't leave you alone. And whether you've ever been to church or whether you've not been to church, whether you've ever prayed or whether you have not prayed, whether you've ever embraced him or whether you've not embraced him, your life has come up before him as these people's lives did. And God is after you. You have got him on your hands. You've got to deal with him because he loves you. If you say, well, that's not my category, I'm over here. I was raised in the church. I've sat through service after service. I know the word of God. I know all the theology. I can sing all the hymns from memory. I know when to stand. I know when to sit. I've got this down. I know the ceremonies. I know how to play, uh, pray in public. I've got this one down. Could I tell you, God is after you. <laughs> he has sent a messenger to you. He won't leave you alone. Because he's not satisfied with that. He's not done with you. Your life is crying out to God. As certainly as their wickedness cried out to God, your unrighteousness is crying out to God. Because that's what he calls the Pharisees and the scribes. A wicked and adulterous generation. Because their focus was off. 
And wherever you are in whatever category, this is the hour to bring yourself under the lordship of the one who sees the cry of your life and wants to embrace you. Why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you do that? Let me give you another contrast. It's the contrast between the people, the Ninevites, the Israelites. And this is in the realm of memories. What kind of memories do the Ninevites have of Jehovah? Absolutely none. What kind of recollection do they have of God's movement in their lives? Absolutely none. How many times has God intervened in their living? We have no record of any interventions. How many times has God spoken to them? We don't have any record that He ever spoke to them. How many ceremonies do they go through in praising Jehovah God? They don't have any ceremonies. They have absolutely no memories, no background, no intervention, no deliverances. They have no Mount Sinai. They have no Ten Commandments. God has done absolutely nothing for them. Come over here. What kind of memories do the Israelites have? On and on and on it goes. All the feast days were set up with one purpose in mind, and that was to remember the great deliverance of the almighty hand of a sovereign God. The Passover. What was the Passover all about? It was the whole ten plagues and God's intervention and bringing them out of Egypt land and the death angel passing over and all of those memories. They celebrated that year after year after year after year after year because they were remembering what God had done in their lives. It was phenomenal. They go back to Abraham, folks. And oh, we get to spend hours talking about this. All of the times that God, the covenants, they had covenants. The Ninevites had no covenant. God didn't come to any Ninevite and set up a covenant and birth a people. That was these boys. These are the chosen. These are the favorites. These are the, these are the ones who've got the memories. These are the ones that say in our history, God did this. These, they... It's phenomenal, their memories. They have memories of gathering around the tabernacle and the cloud of the glory of God descends. And they tremble. And they they tell their kids about this stuff. They built this temple and the holiness of an almighty God descended. And was there any question in their mind that God was moving and God was alive. Man, they had those memories. It was awesome. That's this group. And you say, what difference does that make to me? I want you to put yourself in one of these categories. If you say, well, I have no memories of God's movement. I don't know that God has ever touched me. I don't have any recollection that God ever did anything good in my life. That I've never even met Him. I've not been in a service where God overwhelmed the place and we all got on our knees. I have no sense of His presence. I have no 
memories of God's movement. Ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a treat. Because <laughs> he's coming to your life. There's going to be a Jonah who's going to show up. And you're going to get introduced. Because he's not going to leave you alone. Because your life has cried out to him. And he's coming after you. And if you say tonight, well, I'm not in this category. I'm over here. I've sat through service after service after service. I've heard so many sermons, I can sleep through all of them now. Because no preacher could say anything I haven't already heard. I got this all down, man. I know it all. I've got all kinds of memories of camp meetings and memories of, of God moving upon my life when I was a kid, when I went to an altar. I've got daily vacation Bible school memories of memorizing Scripture. And I've, got, hey, I've got memories, all kinds of memories. Did I tell you tonight? God is coming after you. <laughs> And the scribes and the Pharisees, quite content in their memories. But one called Jesus came to shake them at their core. And so could I tell you, God is coming after you. Your life has cried out to him. And he is not going to leave you where you are. You can count on it. Memories. Uh, let me give you another one. Momentary. Meaning, the moment that Jesus was speaking to them. Jesus is standing before the scribes and the Pharisees, and he's addressing them. And what is it that he has to say? What's the condition at that moment when he's talking to them. Well, for the Ninevites, they don't exist. They're gone. Their nation is wiped out. They've been eliminated. Their city, this was the capital city. Their capital city is gone. They don't exist. What you've got is Israelites. They're under the domination of Rome. They're in a situation where they have freedom to worship, Freedom to do what they want to down at the temple. Freedom to run their own life. And yet they're under the domination of Rome. And they hate it. They get up every morning expecting somehow, some way that God is going to deliver them that day. In fact, in the, in the normal Jewish home, they would get up every morning, look each other in the eye. And the very first words that would come out of their lips are, could this be the day? Could this be the day? Meaning what? Could this be the day when the Messiah will show up? Could this be the hour? Could this be the time? See, they're expecting. They're anticipating. They're longing with everything they've got. Along comes Jesus, who's the exact one that they are longing for. He confronts them. Obviously, you're not over here. Obviously, you are here. And could I tell you, he has shown up in your life. Jesus, don't know how, how to state this as strong as it is, that Jesus is standing in your pathway. You can't go around him. You can't go over him. You can't go beneath him. The only way you can move on in your life is to go through him. You don't have any choice. You can't ignore him. You can't get away from him. I'm telling you, he's giving you the sign of his cross. And you've got to deal with it. Because your life has cried out to him. And he has come. 
He has come. He has come. Let me give you one more. And that really is what we're going to talk about next week. But it's much more. It's interesting that in verse 41, or yes, verse 41, when you come down to the last phrase, it says, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The word greater means much more. So what is he saying in the passage? He's saying, hey, Ninevites, God's love was so great that when he saw you in your wickedness and your total destruction, he could not leave you alone. He had to do something about it. And he sent a Jonah, prophet Jonah. Now, it's interesting when you read Jonah's story, he went the opposite direction. Why? He doesn't like these people. He is prejudiced against these people. They are Gentiles. See, Jews called Gentiles, affectionately, of course, Gentile dogs. To touch one of those people is to defile you. You have to go home and take a bath. See, they, he doesn't preach to these. No, he goes the opposite direction. Finally, coming out of the belly of the great fish, isn't it interesting? He has, he has to go now or end up back in the belly of a fish probably. So he's got to go now. So he's decided to obey God. He goes down to the Ninevites. He preaches to them all the time hating them. And when they repent in chapter 4 verse 1, he's mad. Because he wanted them all damned. That's this. What's going on over here? Jesus has come, the one who is much more. The lover of your soul. The one who cares so much, which is, the, which is what he's saying, the sign. The one who loves you so much, Three days, three nights in the heart of the earth. The one who cares about you to the depth of his being. Not, see, a much more, way beyond, totally, totally beyond, in abundance, beyond compare. He has come to you. See, you're not here. You're over here. And he has come to you. What are you going to do with him? What can you do with him? He's not leaving. He's not leaving, folks. Would you, would you fall in love with him? Would you embrace him with your total being? Would you just, would you just let your whole weight down upon his sovereign love? that wants to support you? Would you just let all the confusion melt? Would you just allow him to just permeate your being? Would you just push aside all the distractions? <laughs> Would you just give up all your self-attempts and Self struggles and would you just would you just collapse in his arms? Would you just 
embrace him in his sign. It's not that hard, is it? Because it's not about figuring it out. It's not about working harder. It's not about, I'm not that disciplined. It's about love, embrace, oneness. He's in your path. Your life has cried out to him. And he has come. Would you please just be his? Jesus, this is not truth coming from the lips of one who doesn't like us. You have not sent one to us who has barriers against us and really would like for us to be damned. Your heart is not one that's out to put us down. You want to embrace us. Would you capture us tonight? with the burning heart of love that is addressing us? Would you pressure us tonight? And God, would you take us beyond all of our false religion and self-righteousness? And We've got memory after memory of all the movement of your being in our lives, we've got, we've got history with you, and yet we, we celebrate the feast days, and yet we still... Would you come tonight? Until the memory would be the present tense. And the present tense would be the reality of the union between you and me. And I would know you as I've never known you before. You are the much more and you've given us a chance way beyond, way beyond. We have seen what others long to see. We've experienced what others just dreamed about and what the prophets saw in visions we walk in reality. The fullness of the Spirit is here. You have come in the wonder of who you are. There is no reason for us to walk in defeat. There is no reason we shouldn't be people of love. The much more. The one who is much more is here. Please, Jesus, embrace us. Embrace us. Oh, embrace us tonight. Uh, heads are bowed. He's in your path. The one who is much more has come. What are you going to do? 
What are you going to do with him? You can't go over him. You can't ignore him. You can't go around him. You can embrace him or you can go through him. But he's in your path. The one who is much more. Listen to him. Listen to him. Want to seek with me tonight?